I was a Protestant pastor, uh, as you were. Started to have doubts about Protestant theology actually while I was doing mission work. Once I see Ignatius of Antioch saying, stay away from anyone who refuses to confess the Eucharist to be the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ. <sighs> Convicted, I would not be recognized as a true Christian by the early church. Oh wow. So I had to join the Catholic Church. My reading of scripture turned from black and white to Panavision, you know, it's a sequence of covenants culminates in the Eucharist, which is the new covenant. And once you see it, like, whoa, so all the color comes on. It was just amazing. Weren't there other cultures who had something similar with this whole thing of offering up animals? How is this distinct? Yeah, yeah, it is similar. Um, for example, they're using Egyptian technology. Actually, the tabernacle looks strikingly similar to the movable war tent of Ramses II, for example. He would sit enthroned with a cherubim on either side. Hmm. Uh, huh, that's interesting, because we know that there's two cherubim on the ark. Here's the difference. Today's sponsor is none other than Ascension. At Ascension, the mission is to present the truth and beauty of the Catholic faith as the path to a fulfilled life and authentic happiness. Ascension shares valuable resources, creates powerful media, and builds communities to answer the longings of the human heart with the transformative power of the gospel. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeff Cavins, and this is the Bible Timeline Show. Today, we're going to be going deep into this period of Egypt and Exodus, and that is the red period in the Bible Timeline chart. And uh, we're gonna focus on one thing in particular, and that is the priesthood. What the priesthood was, and what it was in the New Testament, and what it is today, and how it all fits together. So I think a lot of your questions are going to be answered. The bottom line is that Israel really lost their identity, and God is going to take them out of bondage. And the difficult thing will be for God is not to take Israel uh, out of Egypt, but to get Egypt out of Israel. And that's going to be a process, a process that many of us can identify with because whether you're in North America or you're over in the Philippines or wherever you are at, there is this, there is this dynamic of the culture getting into us and really changing who we are. And God wants us to be known as his people, identified as, as his people, and he will take us through a process where we will become his people. So that's what we're going to be talking about. We also have some uh, wonderful questions prepared, so I want to welcome to the show Dr. Bergsma. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, good to be on with you. Good to be with you, too. Yeah. And yeah, you're doing, you're doing so much good work at Steubenville. What, what's life like in Steubenville? Uh, life is good. You know, it's so wonderful to teach for a university that really just embraces its Catholic mission, and, uh, and we're not... Uh, getting away from that, we're leaning into that more deeply. Um, just uh, greatest respect for our current president, Father Dave Pavanka, mm -hmm. uh, such a great mission leader. And um, I'm just uh, excited to see what the Holy Spirit does with us in the coming decades. Wow, that's, that's beautiful. Now, you're a convert. I am. Tell me a little bit about that. I was a Protestant pastor, uh, as you were, and uh, do urban missions in uh, West Michigan. Did that for four years. Started to have doubts about Protestant theology actually while I was doing mission work. Saw that sola scriptura didn't work. Saw that sola fide or faith alone wasn't really scriptural. Have all these doubts. What to do? What to do with myself? Right. Well, guess I better go back to school. Get my head straight because I'm you know all theologically confused. So I sent out applications to all the different schools. Get accepted at the University of Notre Dame. Meet these fantastic Catholics at the University of Notre Dame. They get me to read the uh, Apostolic Fathers. Mm. Once I see Ignatius of Antioch saying, stay away from anyone who refuses to confess the Eucharist to be the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ. <sighs> Convicted. It's like, oh my gosh, uh, I would not be recognized as a true Christian by the early church. Oh, wow. So I had to join the Catholic Church 2001, February 24, 2001. As a modern non-denominational church, yours was, you were a denomination. Uh, yeah, I was Calvinist, yeah. Calvinist. The Dutch Reform. Dutch Reform. Yeah. They thought, well, you know, Catholics have a lot right, but uh, we Calvinists were like Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? We, we do one thing right. You know, we do Scripture properly. Yeah. And so I thought, I've got Scripture down, but I'm going to get all these other things like liturgy and ethics and so on. Mm -hmm. was surprised. Not only did I get all the liturgy and the ethics, but uh, my reading of Scripture turned from black and white to 
Panavision, you know, full color, just amazing. Because mm -hmm. once I began receiving the sacraments, then you begin to see the sacraments everywhere in Scripture. Yeah. You realize all the typology that's all leading up to uh, the Eucharist, the, the, the New Covenant. You know as well as anyone, it's a sequence of covenants culminates in the Eucharist, which is the New Covenant, according right. to 2220. And once you see it, like, whoa, so all the color comes on. It was just amazing. Well, I think people are going to hear today as we talk about the priesthood back in uh, Egypt in the Exodus, and we're going to we're going to really for the first time encounter this concept of priesthood. We just came out of the of the patriarchal period, and it's not quite as clear there. Right. And even before that, in the early world, uh, it's not as clear. So bring us up to speed from really from the beginning of the Bible as far as a synopsis and where are we at now in Egypt and Exodus? Yeah. Okay. So priesthood begins already with Adam. Uh, J ancient Jews clearly recognized that Adam was a priest. And you can see it in the biblical text. Uh, Genesis 2.15 says he's placed in the garden to work and guard the garden. And unbeknownst to us Americans, those are that's priestly terminology. Later in the book of Numbers, the uh, the priests are sent to work and to guard in the tabernacle, which is what mm -hmm. we'll be talking about. So Adam was the first priest. Eden was the first sanctuary, first temple, and uh, the priesthood was passed from father to firstborn son, all the way down to Noah, and then subsequently from Noah, from father to firstborn, all the way down to Abraham was the Jewish tradition. And uh, then in the period of the patriarchs with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you see those patriarchs functioning as priests for their family as well as for their whole tribe because they were, you know, they probably had maybe 3,000 people in this big tribe that was moving around, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so they function as priests for that community. And, uh, and then they end up at the end of Genesis going down into Egypt. And then in Egypt, where they st spend 400 years, the priesthood gets lost as they get Egyptianized and they begin to practice Egyptian religion, mm -hmm. as we later find out with the Golden Calf episode where they revert to what they have been doing in Egypt. So the priesthood gets muddied there, but when we come into the, uh, the beginning of the book of Exodus, we have our Lord, of course, uh, calling Moses uh, to bring them out. And then one of the things that happens, it's, it's a little bit subtle, but in the 10th plague, we all know the firstborn of the Egyptians are put to death, but the firstborn of the Israelites are consecrated, and that's a term that implies ordained to priesthood. So that um, you know that that last plague consecrates the firstborn of Israel. And what we're doing is we're restoring that priesthood of the firstborn that really is a tradition going back to Adam. So at that point, uh, you know, during the Exodus and all the way out to Sinai, you have the priesthood of the firstborn. In Exodus 24, it talks about young men that helped Moses to offer sacrifices at the foot of Sinai. Mm -hmm. Those would have been the firstborn from each tribe. And, um, and so that works well enough for about 40 days. <laughs> <laughs> and then we get the golden calf episode. Right. They revert to Egyptian worship. And since the firstborn uh, sons did not stop that, they lose that priestly status and they're replaced by the Levites, the tribe of Levi, mm -hmm. which rallies to Moses uh, to put an end to this idolatry. And so they gain a clerical status or a priestly status that they will keep throughout the rest of the Old Testament until the time of our Lord. That is a great synopsis, you know, as you go through uh, and bring us all the way, all the way up there. Two, two questions. One is, Backing up just a little bit in the in the patriarchal period, you say the the, the firstborn was a priest. Uh, Describe what does he do? He didn't go to mass. He didn't. He, what, right. what did a priest do back then? Yeah, yeah. So a priest um, does several things, but offers sacrifice mm -hmm. uh, on behalf of the family, uh, leads the family in worship. Um, in short, the priest is really responsible for the covenant relationship between God and his people. Okay. That's like the way I like to phrase it. And oftentimes that involves, obviously, leading in worship, making intercession, mediating the forgiveness of sin. But the priest is responsible to make sure that that covenant bond, which is really a family bond between God and his people, is kept sound, healthy, safe, maintained, Etc. So, in a sense, at Sinai, which we'll look into here in a moment with the, the golden calf incident in chapter 32, is the country laicized in a way? Yes, well, um, to a certain extent. 
uh, in Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6, we see a very beautiful expression. God tells the people, if you keep this covenant, you will be my special possession and you'll be a royal priesthood. That's Exodus 19, 5 and 6. That royal priesthood is important because that was the status of Adam. Mm -hmm. If we look into Genesis 1 and 2, very clear that Adam was both king and priest. So the, the status of Adam is being offered to Israel as a kind of corporate Adam. They're going to be raised back up to that Adamic status. And uh, so there was a kind of a, a general, they were a priestly people and a royal, pre, uh, a royal people. They had that. Um, but then even amongst their number, there were those that were set aside to lead the actual acts of worship. And uh, it's much like the structure of the church. Uh, we're all baptized into Christ's priesthood, and yet there are those amongst us who are set aside specifically for leadership and worship in our mm -hmm. situation in the New Covenant for the celebration of the sacraments. I love what you say when, uh, when, you, t when you say that the priest is really uh, reminding them and, uh, and bringing people together around the covenant, yeah. that the covenant is the, is the thing. And as you go back, you have the, the covenant with you know, marriage in, Ad in Adam and Eve, you have Noah, right. you have Abraham, and now it's expanding and God is gonna make a covenant with Israel with Moses as, as, the, as the leader. And so that covenant at Sinai is gonna become incredibly important. But before we look at that, and that which happens at Sinai, Melchizedek. Yeah. That name comes up prior, and I think a lot of people don't know what quite to do with that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Melchizedek makes a cameo appearance in Genesis 14, very enigmatic character, but I think that we should follow the lead of the Jewish tradition. And the Jewish tradition understood Melchizedek to be uh, Shem, son of Noah. Mm -hmm. Melchizedek obviously means king of righteousness. That's not what you're going to name your child. Uh, it's, a, it's a throne name, right? Right. So his real name was something else. The, the Jewish tradition filled in that gap and said, look, this is Shem, the son of Noah, who lives into the time of Abraham. And uh, the reason why Abraham defers to him is because he is a kind of a high priest over humanity. He was Noah's firstborn son. The Jewish tradition also identified him as the founder of the city of Salem, mentioned in Genesis 14, which later comes to be known as Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And this is why Jerusalem held a, a sacred status within Israelite culture, and that became so important when David makes it his capital. Um, so there is that, um, that priesthood of, uh, of Melchizedek, which really is the priesthood of the firstborn son going back to Adam. Um, so that's significant. And later, David uh, will become king of Jerusalem, in 2 Samuel 5, he'll sit down on the seat or the throne of Jerusalem, which is the seat of Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. And he's going to enter into that succession and he's going to inherit the uh, royal priestly rights that go back to the founder of that city. And that's why Psalm 110 says of David and his heirs, you are priests forever or a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That, that, that phrase right there is, is uh, familiar. A lot of Catholics are familiar with that right. phrase, especially if you've been to uh, an ordination. Right. And here is a modern man who is becoming a priest and they go all the way back to, to Melchizedek. And let's just jump up there for a second. Why are, why are modern day priests, and we're gonna talk about modern day priests, but why are they connected back to Melchizedek? Yeah, because that's the priesthood our Lord has, because our Lord is the son of David. And uh, you know the, the last verse of 2 Samuel chapter eight says, David's sons were priests. And especially that applies to David's greatest son, who's uh, our Lord. And so it's a, it's a priesthood of Melchizedek. Um, and, and through Melchizedek going back all the way to Adam. So it's, we could almost say it's an Adamic priesthood sure. as well. Now, the Levitical priesthood was a plan B that came in response, as we'll talk about, uh, to the uh, golden calf tobacco. Mm -hmm. uh, but the plan A was always this priesthood of the firstborn son, which flows down from Adam to Melchizedek and to David and ultimately to our Lord. Mm -hmm. So when our, when our Lord shares his priesthood with the apostles, the priesthood that, that he is sharing is the Melchizedekian priesthood. And that applies to all those who enter into holy orders and are sharing that uh, that priesthood of Christ to this day. Well, we're going to look at that a little bit a little bit more as we as we move on. But let's let's settle in at Sinai for uh, just a, mo a moment, maybe a year, and uh, <laughs> and and things everything changed at Mount Sinai. It took them three months to come down. Uh, they they wrestled with the Lord a bit. They were they were um, rebellious. Yeah. And after three months, they settle at Mount Sinai, and, th and three really big things happened there. They got the Torah. 
Mm-hmm. They got the Word of God, uh, the, the manna, of course. They got the tabernacle, the right. tabernacle, uh, a form in which they would worship, something that Moses received up on the mountain. But then they got the priesthood. So I guess that's four, but they got the priesthood. They received the priesthood. Let's talk about this Levitical priesthood. How did that come about? What was the purpose of it? And how was that different than Melchizedek? So you have, you know, you have through the plagues this consecration of the firstborn. And that was understood in the Jewish tradition as, you know, this, these firstborn function as, as priests. Moses goes up on the mountain. He takes a long time up there. They get impatient. They want to go back to what I like to call good old foot stop and snake handling Egyptian bull worship. You know, <laughs> this is kind of their ancestral religion that they've been practicing in Egypt for uh, 400 years. As you probably know, it's often thought to be the apis, uh, you know, bull god. Yeah. That uh, that they that they made an image of you know and danced around you know kind of uh, it's kind of sex drugs and rock and roll kind of like pagans worship to this day yeah. and they're doing that around the around the golden calf and uh, and there's a failure on the part of the firstborn to stop that and to put that down so when Moses comes down from the mountain he calls for who's ever faithful to the Lord to rally around him and put an end to this idolatry mm-hmm. and his own tribe rallies to him and that's the tribe of Levi. And so they go through the camp, they put to death the ringleaders of this profane rebellion, and in, uh, in reward for that fidelity, that courage, and that fortitude that they, sh- that they showed, Moses says to them, this day you have ordained yourselves for the service of the yeah. Lord. And so at that point, they are going to take over then for the firstborn. And you see that in the book of Numbers where they count up the firstborn and they count up the Levites. And they have a ceremony to accommodate for the discrepancy in the number. And then thereafter, the, um, the Levites are going to take on the clerical role for uh, the people of Israel. Okay. And we'll get to what they're going to end up doing with the tabernacle. But I got to ask you one of these difficult questions because people, they struggle when people die in the Bible. Yeah. You know, so you got the guys, they had a Woodstock party. Right. Uh, they were confused. They were they were infants in the faith, in a sense. Moses comes down the mountain, sees what's going on, and uh, a lot of people paid with their with their lives. Soften that for me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Of people like, right. whoa, that was yeah. I, that. Couldn't you have had a conference or something? <laughs> <laughs> you know, God always acts out of His love, and um, you know the fact that these people were put to death does not mean that they went to hell. Mm-hmm. And we have to realize that, you know, as I like to tell my students, um, God treats the Israelites in the Old Testament much like we treat young children. So consequences are immediate and consequences tend to be physical. And it's not because you don't like your child, it's because you don't want your child to be harmed. You know, so he's crawling towards the stove, get a few swats on the on the bottom so that he doesn't burn himself, which would be a very serious thing. So in the case of the people of Israel here, you know, there's, there's a quick immediate uh, physical punishment in case some individuals lose their lives, better a few than the whole uh, nation to be Mm -hmm. lost by the chaos that would ensue if they continued along this degrading path uh, of worship. And so God always acts out of his love. And so we have to understand that even when God wills or puts to death in the Old Testament, it's for the sake of the eternal salvation uh, of his people, and even sometimes those individuals, mm-hmm. um, because the fear of death and experience of death oftentimes brings about repentance in us, if yeah. we would be honest about it. So here we are at Mount Sinai. There is now a tribe, the Levites. They are the priests. Moses has received this idea of creating a tabernacle. There's also the Torah, as the centerpiece being the Ten Words or the, the Ten Commandments. What is the relation, two things. One is, what is the relationship between the priests and that tabernacle and that Torah that was given at Sinai? That's, that's number one. And what is different in their role from the common person? You know, can a common person say, well, you know, if you guys get tired of that, I can relieve you for a few hours. <laughs> Those are the two things I'm interested in going deeper into. Right, absolutely. So um, with regard to the Torah, uh, the, the Levitical priests are the authoritative interpreters. Um, there never was there a sola scriptura situation. Um, in Deuteronomy 17, it makes very clear that if you have a question about the interpretation of the law, you go to the Levitical priests and they will give you the answer. Later in Matthew 16, we'll see that authority given to Peter. 
And in Matthew 18, we'll see uh, that authority also shared with the, the apostles as a whole, that, that authority to interpret God's law, because that's one major function of the priesthood. So that's their relationship to the Torah. Their relationship to the tabernacle is that they celebrate the liturgy that goes on in that tabernacle. Mm-hmm. And their relationship with the rest of the tribes is kind of symbolized by how those tribes are encamped. If you look at that, you'll see that the Levites are encamped around the tabernacle, and then the other tribes are more distant. And that represents the fact that for the rest of the tribes to interact with God, they were going to have to go through the Levites. And so the Levites were mediators, they were go-betweens that would quite literally oftentimes receive the the sacrifices of the people, the sacrificial animal, the lamb, the goat, whatever, turn around and then offer that on the altar to God. So Mm -hmm. they were the face of God to the people and they were the face of the people to God. And then that's always true of priesthood. There's always the two faces of the priesthood. Now, is there anybody, anybody in the narrative, family included, uh, that said, well, you know, I could do that. It wasn't, it wasn't part of the priesthood. Right. Oh, yes, definitely. So, you know, we're, we're into, um, you know, the, the narrative of uh, the book of Numbers, and we have this huge blow up uh, shortly after they leave Sinai with Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, right. who come forward, and they're not Levites, and they want to function as priests. And it's almost like, a, you know, a proto-Protestant uh, <laughs> reformation. <laughs> it's like, you know, priesthood of all God's people, you know, there should not be a Levitical priesthood, and, yeah. and so on. And you get a whole rebellion, and God has to act and intervene, and uh, <laughs> more people die. And, How did uh, that work out mess. for them? Yeah, it didn't work out very well. And... Uh, <laughs> God, uh, um, you know, intervened to not only um, confirm the Levitical priesthood, but in particular Aaron um, in his role as high priest, you know, kind of uh, a type of, of the Pope or, you know, the, the, uh, Peter and his successors. Mm-hmm. And um, so uh, the Lord through Moses said, you know, okay, let all these, you know, all these people that are claiming priesthood, et cetera, let them all put their staffs uh uh, together and we'll wait overnight and see what happens. And the next day, the staff of Aaron blossomed and uh, clearly indicating God's blessings on Aaron as high priest. And so that, that blossomed rod of Aaron ultimately goes into uh, the Ark of the Covenant as the sign of the priesthood. Mm-hmm. And this, remember this, this miracle through which God intervened to show those through whom he wished the liturgy to be celebrated. Well, I'm not going to be devil's advocate, but I will be doubter's advocate with, okay. with, with us here today. So you've got the tabernacle, you've got the priesthood, you've got the Torah, you, you have everything there at Mount Sinai, the furnishings, the setup of, of the tabernacle. Is this unique? Is, it, it, uh, if someone said, well, weren't there other cultures who had something similar with this whole thing of offering up animals and so forth, what makes the story of numbers, Exodus and Numbers, unique to yeah. to what we'll say is world religion. How is this distinct? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it is similar. Um, for example, they're using Egyptian technology, and uh, and we can find that actually the tabernacle looks strikingly similar to the movable war tent of Ramses II, for example, one of the pharaohs who was worshipped as a god. So since the Egyptians considered the pharaoh to be a god, they built a kind of place of worship that that would move with him when he went out to war. Mm -hmm. And we can see similarities. So the Israelites, having lived in Egypt for 400 years, would have understood kind of the cultural message of the structure of the tabernacle and, okay, this is a a movable shrine. Uh, And we even have engravings of of Ramses war tent where he would sit enthroned with a cherubim on either side. Hmm. Uh, Huh, that's interesting because we know that there's two cherubim on the ark. Hmm. Here's the difference. In the sacred place of the tabernacle, there is nobody sitting between the uh, wings of the cherubim, yeah. okay? Yeah. There is no image there. There's no idol there. There's no human being sitting there. It is the unseen creator God. Mm-hmm. So what we're doing is we're using uh, contemporary uh, cultural technology. We're using uh, contemporary cultural messaging from uh, you know the, the late second millennium uh, BC to communicate a radically different message. This is a God unlike the gods of the nations. Mm-hmm. We're using a, a familiar architectural language so that it would be not completely alien and incomprehensible to the people of Israel so they can understand, okay, I understand what kind of building this is and what's going on here. We're worshiping, but there's no idol. And that's crazy unlike all the other nations. 
In fact, almost everything that God did with Israel at Sinai, the, the way they dressed, the way they ate, the way they celebrated, their relationships and marriage, everything seemed to be uh, pulling them away from Indeed. A, 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 a culture and into a different light. That's right. Because in both Egyptian and Canaanite religion, uh, sex and death were mixed into worship. Mm. So the Egyptians, for example, worshiped at the tombs of their pharaohs. The tombs became great shrines. Uh, the Canaanites engaged in sexual activity in their worship, probably the Egyptians as well. And when you look in uh, Leviticus and the other books of the Torah, nothing related to sex and death may come into the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a very different kind of, of uh, faith and religious practice. Furthermore, the animals sacred to the Egyptians, like the ram that was sacred to the Egyptian sun god, who was the head of the pantheon mm -hmm. in Egyptian religion, the ram was sacrificed regularly in different offerings to the Lord God, as well as cows and other sacred animals as well. And this is one of the reasons why Moses when, when, when Pharaoh says, why don't you just sacrifice here in the land of Egypt? Moses says, no, if we sacrifice these animals, the Egyptians are going to kill us. So what, what's really happening is God is taking the Israelites out and making them sacrifice what once they had considered to be sacred animals, now to the true God, the creator of heaven and earth. Now, what you're bringing out, I think, is, is really encouraging because a, a lot of people will think, well... I thought that God would come up with something totally new, brand new. It's like, this is our thing. We left that behind. But there's something really powerful about God actually using the technology of the Egyptians right. to show you the difference in, yes. in, in, in what, what he's trying to do in their life. Right. I think it's brilliant, actually. It you is. I, I, I totally agree. I mean, it's just like our Lord coming down and speaking to us in human language, you know. As a rabbi. Uh, right. And he didn't come down speaking a Martian tongue or some <laughs> alien dialect. You know, he spoke Aramaic and Greek, the language of the street. If he had come today, he would speak English to us. Yeah. So he speaks to us in the language of our culture. And that includes not only our words, but also things like architecture and art and so on. But again, using that cultural language to present a radically different message. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's beautiful. So if you're a priest in the, in the Old Testament, and we're talking about the Egypt and Exodus, even after this period of, uh, of the, the one-year stay at Mount Sinai, and then they break camp in numbers, they move up to Kadesh Barnea, they're going to send spies up into the land. What is God's goal at that point, and do you, how, how would the priests fit into that? Because the goal seems to be, we're going to go take the land. Right. Well, the priests had an important part in warfare as well, um, in leading the people out, mm. um, carrying the ark before the people. The ark represented God's presence, so he would go out to battle with his people. And uh, we see that in a dramatic way, for example, at the beginning of the conquest of the land in the book of Joshua. Uh, going in, and uh, it's the priests who lead the procession around Jericho, you know, mm -hmm. once a day for seven days, seven times on the seventh day, um, blasting on trumpets. And uh, so there is, it's like spiritual warfare, you know, really, in advance. We think of that famous passage in Ephesians 6 where St. Paul talks about spiritual warfare, but you've got spiritual warfare going on in the Old Testament because we should remember that uh, the Israelites called on the true God. The Canaanites would call on their pagan, you know, really demons, their demon deities. Mm -hmm. And so every act of warfare in the ancient world was also an act of spiritual warfare because everybody was always calling on their own deities. So it was a conflict to see whose God is the true God. And there was a liturgical aspect to the conquest of the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Jericho, the first city to be taken, is really taken through a liturgical procession. It's through an act of worship. It really was, wasn't it? That, that the walls come down mm -hmm. and, uh, and they're able to take possession of the land. Yeah, I think of Jehoshaphat as, yeah. as well. You know, Later, when, yeah. When warfare is, uh, yeah. is needed, let's call on the choir. Exactly. You know? The Levitical choir goes out and, uh, yeah, gives praise yeah. and God's enemies are defeated. Yeah, and David even, uh, moving ahead just a little bit, David even came up with the idea of almost like a perpetual adoration, you yeah. know, in the, in the, in the temple yeah. where priests came and, uh, and, and spent two weeks there at different, at different times. So I want to jump to the New Testament because I can't wait to get there because then we're going to have some real serious questions answered at that point. But as we move out from Sinai, 
they do not trust God. God says, okay, for every day you were spying out the land, you're going to wander around in the wilderness for a year. Forty years in the wilderness, everyone underneath 20 is going to grow up and they're going to possess the land, but their parents, they're going to die off. They're going to die off in, in the desert. And as you said, the priest played a major role 40 years later of coming into, into the land. But then once they settled in the land in Joshua, these priests sort of spread out, mm -hmm. don't they? And wh what is their role then? Yeah, well, they were still to interpret God's law for his people and instruct them. And then, um, you know, the, the system of government that Moses sets up in Deuteronomy is very decentralized. And it's really up to the elders of the people to, to rule each town and to consult with the priests to get God's law. Well, it doesn't work out very well. And uh, so the, the, the book of uh, Judges is, is actually kind of an, an apology for the kingship. And it says, uh, you know, God's people, Israel, really are not, as it were, mature enough to self-govern. And um, not only do we get abuses in terms of uh, the elders of these communities leading the people astray and even, you know, bringing in Canaanite and other pagan, pagan practices, um, but we get failures of the priesthood and we get uh, even some schisms where, for example, the tribe of Dan grabs a priest in a kind of an unauthorized way and then runs off to the north and sets up a separate sanctuary. So we get a lot of moral and religious chaos. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the situation we're in through most of the book of Judges into Samuel, where things only start to clear a little bit through the leadership of Samuel. And then finally, we get the establishment of the monarchy, which has its weaknesses, but at least was able to um, put down uh, a lot of the uh, paganism that was going on and kind of centralize and organize and uh, get the people yeah. back worshiping on a firm footing. And then that brings us up to 722 BC. And you've got this, this awful split between yeah. the 10 tribes to the north, Jeroboam leads them, and then Rehoboam with, with the two tribes in, in the south. And this is where I see the disaster of a false priesthood, the disaster of leaving the tabernacle and the priesthood, and for a period of time, I'll, you know, I'll, you know, from 930 BC when it splits to 722, I should have said, you've got this disaster in the north, which, yeah. is, which is related to the priesthood. It is, right. In 1 Kings uh, 12, we have what I like to call the divorce between the people of Israel and their bridegroom king, mm -hmm. and, and that's the bridegroom king's fault because Rehoboam, the heir of Solomon, acts like a chauvinistic jerk towards his bride people, makes these swaggering boasts, etc. So you sympathize with, you know, bride Israel breaking off and, and uh, uh, as it were, shacking up with a different king yeah. who is uh, Jeroboam. Uh, but Jeroboam immediately goes back to the heir of the golden calf. Only twice as worse. Now there's two of them. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's got the, the golden calf in the north in, at Dan and the, the golden calf in the south in Beersheba. Uh, I'm sorry, in Bethel, uh, so that the people can uh, you know, have access to this idolatrous worship. And then makes a uh, kind of a mockery of the uh, Israelite liturgy by just shifting things, you know. So a month later, not the seventh month, but the eighth month, you know. Mm -hmm. And then instead of uh, choosing priests from the Levites, which was commanded by God, chooses priests from anybody. Anybody could be a priest, you know? So just mm. by, by royal appointment. So he's really a Henry VIII kind of character, you know, strong similarities between Jeroboam and Henry VIII. That was an interesting study. Setting, uh, yeah, absolutely. Setting up a national religion, kind of a national church. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, the, it's no longer the Church of God, it's the Church of Israel now. Okay, so one more stop before we get to the New Testament, because this mm -hmm. is what we really want to get to. We have this, we've been following this, you've been doing a great job. I just love it, the way you, you can tell this narrative about the priesthood, puts it into focus so clear, uh, and I just love it. So then, after the, the split in the kingdom, 930, right. 722, the north is decimated by the Assyrians. Assyrians. 587, the south is decimated by the Babylonians. They're in captivity up there in exile for 70 years, they come back, everything seems to be sort of hmm, not too bad until the Greeks come and we have the whole desecration of the temple and the Maccabean revolt 
But right. then there's this period right before Jesus right. that seems to be the Hasmonean period. That, right. that, that it, and I apologize for all these names, but you can Google it. The Hasmonean period where there seems to be rel relatively uh, uh, peaceful atmosphere. Is the priesthood active in any way at this at this point? Well, absolutely. I mean, with with uh, the re the resurgence or the, the coming back of the Judeans from Babylon, uh, beginning in 537, and you know, completing the uh, the replacement temple, the second temple mm -hmm. in 517, we get the res restoration of the Levitical priesthood. We get the high priesthood restored, and it more or less remains stable um, through that time. We get that desec desecration. Uh, under uh, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, that wicked Greek king that the Maccabeans eventually kick out and uh, restore true worship. Mm -hmm. That's around the middle of the 100s there, say between 165 and 155 thereabouts. Um, but, uh, but this is the issue. The Maccabean kings, also known as the Hasmoneans, in 152, they take over the high priesthood. And this was not licit. Mm. They were Levites, but they were not sons of Zadok, and Zadok being a son of Aaron. So they did not have the blood of the high priesthood in them. And in 152 BC, the Maccabean king, Jonathan Aphis, muscles his way into the high priesthood, takes over, and that corrupts uh, the high priestly line. And the people of Judea knew it, and they lost confidence in the leadership of the temple priesthood. And uh, into that uh, religious leadership vacuum, uh, the Pharisees inserted themselves. And so the Pharisees began to interpret the law and to teach the people because they had lost confidence in the priesthood. And so when we open up the pages of the New Testament, we need to remember that Annas and Caiaphas are, in a sense, imposters. Sure. They are descendants of this corrupted priesthood that did not have the right bloodline and gained control through political machination. So good, so good. This. I got I to gotta tell you, my friends, if you have never studied the priesthood before, this is uh, one of the best I've ever heard at going through the whole thing. But now, Dr. Bergsma, we come to the New Testament, we don't have to worry about it anymore because we're all Christians and we're all <laughs> part of the royal priesthood and that's how it ends. And isn't it wonderful? Yes, it is wonderful, but there's still a need for... Uh, uh, men to be set aside to lead the whole priestly community in worship, and Jesus makes provision for that. Okay. And, and really what you see in the, in the Gospels is step by step, different uh, duties that were the prerogative of the Le Levitical priesthood under the Old Covenant are, are, again, step by step given to the apostles. So, for example, one of the most important duties of the priests was to interpret God's law. And in the first century, the interpretation of God's law was referred to as binding and loosing. Uh, to mm -hmm. prohibit something on the basis of God's law was called binding it, and to allow it was called loosing it. And so in Matthew 16, where our Lord says to St. Peter, among other things, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What he's doing is giving that power of interpretation of God's law to Peter in, in the... Uh, responsibility of his own person. And then later in Matthew 18, he refers to, in, in you plural, speaking to a group, y'all, or yins, as we say in the Pittsburgh area, you know, you guys uh, uh, as a group uh, also will be able to bind and to loose. And that's represented uh, to this day in, in the structure of the Catholic Church, where, where we recognize two infallible voices, either the Pope by his own authority, the successor of Peter, or the apostles as a group, which we understand to be an ecumenical council where the mm -hmm. bishops are gathered as the uh, apostolic college. So that's, but that's a priestly duty. That's an important thing. Then at the Last Supper, he says, do this as my memorial offering. That's one way to, in, you know, translate those words that are often rendered, you know, do this in memory of me. But he's teaching them to, uh, to perform the sacrifice of the new covenant and commissioning them to offer that. That's also a priestly duty. And then again, at the end of John, in John 20, when he breathes on them and says, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, uh, that's the mediation of forgiveness of sins. Go back to Leviticus 5, and you see that that was the responsibility of the priesthood to mediate forgiveness of sins under the Old Covenant. Now it's beginning to, being given to the apostles. So again, step by step, the responsibilities of sacrifice, mediation of forgiveness, interpretation of God's law, 
given to the apostles. And then if we trace through carefully in the book of Acts, we see the apostles sharing it with this group called the presbyters, often translated elders mm -hmm. in English. And that those are the, the, the first generation of the men in holy orders. So where would you say in the New Testament, because people who don't necessarily believe in a modern priesthood that are part of non-denominational churches or, yeah. or um, you know, uh, the you know people who are part of the Reformation, they would say, well, it doesn't say in the New Testament that anybody is to become a priest like a Levite would. That was rather obvious in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, is there a beginning to this priesthood? And does Jesus, is he alluding to? Is there a pre, is there a New Testament priesthood? And how did you how did you perpetuate that? Right. Yeah. A good question. Uh, so there's there's two moments in particular. You know, the Jesus uh, forming the apostles as a new priesthood for the new covenant is a process. But there are, in particular, two moments that are uh, kind of pivotal. Uh, one obviously is in the upper room where he says, "Do this in remembrance of me," which has a, a cultic liturgical sound to it. If it, when you're looking in the original language there, again, as I say, it could be translated, "Do this as my memorial sacrifice." It's kind of resonant with, uh, you know, the um, the ambiance of the temple where you had a memorial sacrifice under the old covenant, which mm -hmm. is uh, set up by Moses to renew the covenant between God and His people. And uh, so he has, him, he has the apostles authorizing them in the upper room to offer the sacrifice of the new covenant. That's a priestly act. And again, the breathing on them in John 20 and the, giving a, the dispensing of the power to forgive sins. This is also a pivotal moment mm -hmm. in them becoming a priesthood for uh, the new covenant. But when we trace through the, and we read carefully, if you really read carefully in the book of Acts, you see that the apostles clearly rule over the early Christian community, such that uh, their, their honor and their leadership is so respected that people sell all that they have and give all of the money to the apostles. That's a you know, severe act of trust there. And Ananias and Sapphira, you know, famously fall down dead when they lie to Peter. So this is kind of the, uh, the majesty mm -hmm. with which the apostles rule over the early community. But then we, we see them laying hands on other men to bestow upon them authority. In Acts 6, uh, the, f the first seven, what we traditionally understand as deacons, and then later in Acts 14 and elsewhere, they appoint uh, men that they call presbuteroi, or elders. And we later find out it really doesn't have anything to do with their age because Timothy is a presbyter in, um, in the first uh, letter to Timothy, and, but Paul says, don't let anybody look down on you because you're young. Mm -hmm. So it really wasn't just that they were you know, gray-haired men. But even young men could be appointed as elders, as presbyteri. And that's the word that we get priest from. It doesn't come from the ancient Greek word for priest. It actually comes from presbyteros. So there's this kind of a, you know, uh, problem in English that we have because of the etymology of these terms. Yeah. But quite literally, Jesus, you know, in, in, in Acts, we are seeing the apostles taking their own authority, which had been given to them by Christ, and placing it on other men through the imposition of hands, to share their ministry with them. And, and this comes out so clearly in 1 Peter chapter 5, where Peter exhorts all the presbyters that they have appointed and says, as a fellow presbyter, I exhort you, mm. tend the flock of God in your care. Well, if they're tending the flock, that means that they're shepherds because shepherds are people that tend flocks. And we know that Peter is you know, kind of the primary shepherd at the end of John 21, where he's three times commissioned to shepherd the whole people. So clearly, Peter is conscious that the, pre the presbyters are sharing with him this shepherding, shepherding duty over the flock of Christ. And that is that leadership role that we identify as the priesthood of the new covenant. Well, we know and by what you said that the priests would oversee the, the sacrifices in the Old Testament, which the sacrifices were critical. They were really important sacrifices. It's not just show or yeah. anything like that. Um, the really serious sacrifices. When we come to the New Testament, uh, it would stand a reason that if there is a sacrifice in the New Testament, you certainly would want a priest overseeing, yes. overseeing that because uh, it's in the Old Testament, not just anybody could say, well, I'm going to no. do it today. I feel led by the Lord to go into the Holy of Holies yeah. today. 
it won't come out, but, <laughs> but I feel led to go in there. In the New Testament now, there is a sacrifice. And is right. that what is, if there is a sacrifice, it necessitates it does. A priest. It does. And, and, and this, this dawned on me as I was coming to the church. So my own conversion was primarily from encountering Ignatius of Antioch, his famous testimony to the real presence, where in his letter to the Smyrnians, he warns the early Christians in the town of Smyrna in modern-day Turkey. He says, stay away from anyone who refuses to confess the Eucharist to be the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ. And so meditating on that, I'm like, wow, if the Eucharist is really the flesh of Jesus, obviously it can't just be that every baptized person can just make the Eucharist. Because then you'd have baptized seven-year-olds, you know, consecrating Ritz crackers in their bedrooms, you know, and it would lead to sacrilege and profanation and, and just chaos. So uh, the, the real presence and the priesthood go hand in hand. If Jesus is really there and there really is a transformation that takes place, mm -hmm. then there has to be an order of men who are prepared uh, to, to, uh, to perform that and to guard the Eucharist from profanation. And so within about a day and a half of the real presence dawning on me, I realized, gosh, if there's a real presence, there also, there also has to be a ministerial priesthood mm -hmm. uh, to guard it, to celebrate it, and not to keep us away from it, quite the opposite, to ensure that we have a pure encounter with it. Yeah. So that our encounter with the Eucharist is genuine, in safety, in purity, without admixture of false teaching or sin. Etc. And you know the the way that we receive the Eucharist really represents the role of the priest. The priest is not there to get in between us and Jesus. The priest is there to facilitate a pure and direct encounter with Jesus. And so when we come to the priest, we don't eat the priest, right? We eat the Eucharist mm -hmm. that He gives us. So He's there to facilitate and make possible that direct encounter between us and Jesus and make sure that that direct encounter takes place in an atmosphere of safety and purity. Mm -hmm. So the more, more serious the sacrifice, the more important it is to have the proper authority to uh, do this. Yeah, yeah, because there is a big difference between the Eucharist and Ritz crackers. That's right. And if it was Ritz crackers, then who, who wants to do it this week? Right. Right. You know, <laughs> right. Who wants? And and but that's what the that's where I came from as being a pastor of a non-denominational church. There was really no way to to, uh, to perform sacrilege or anything like right. that, and we could do it as often as we wanted, or we could skip weeks or whatever. Right. Yeah. But Saint Paul says in First Corinthians ten and eleven in his Eucharistic teaching, he says, "Look, if you receive unworthily, you are guilty of profaning the body and blood of our Lord. Not a symbol thereof, you know, or not some kind of indirect thing. You know, you're really guilty of." the body and blood of the Lord, using a phrase that's, that's, that's used in the Old Testament for, for very grave sin. And uh, it, it, would, it would just not be such an offense if we were play acting. Yeah, right. Well, you, what you're saying is that, that it's, you're raising the priesthood up in the New Testament higher than it's ever been in the Old Testament. Indeed. And it's more precious, it's more important, it has great... Uh, gravitas, yeah. because we're dealing with the body and blood, soul and divinity of of Jesus. Man, I th I would think that if young men knew this, <laughs> this might change the the course of their life in discerning. Right. Yeah. No. If you really appreciate what the Eucharist is, you know, it's it's hard to see how you could not be drawn towards mm -hmm. the priesthood. Indeed. Going back to the Old Testament in uh, the Egypt and Exodus period. Do you think Moses had any inkling of, of this? I mean, he ended up with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration <laughs> and had a reunion party there. Right, right. Yeah, well, I think that uh, towards the end of his life, you know, Moses himself prophesies that a new covenant is coming. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, he kind of looks forward into salvation history. And you can even see how he, in broad strokes, kind of indicates how there's going to be a, a time of prosperity, which was experienced under David and Solomon, followed by a time of, 
uh, decline and exile, uh, which of course did pan out. Mm -hmm. And then there would be a kind of a regathering into the land. And then there would be a restoration of prosperity, which we actually do get under the Maccabees and the Herodians, great material prosperity for God's people. And then at that time, there would, there would be a circumcision of the heart in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. Mm -hmm. And there in Acts at Pentecost in Acts 2, when under Peter's spirit-inspired preaching, it says that the, 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 the Israelites gathered from all those nations into Jerusalem, hearing this preaching, were cut to the heart. And I think that's really the, the circumcision of the heart taking place that Moses foresaw on really the final days of his life. Uh, as he preaches at the end of Deuteronomy. But of course, circumcision is a covenant-making ritual. A circumcision of the heart would have to be an interior covenant, uh, like a supernatural covenant, not made in your flesh, uh, but that, that God would make in, in the very soul, the very nature of, of the human being. And so that's, you know, at the end of Deuteronomy, there you have Moses seeing that God is going to one day send a new covenant, which is going to be in, in a, a supernatural uh, dimension that's going to be beyond what we can do with our hands, as it were. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'd say, yeah, Moses foresaw the coming of the new covenant and that in a sense, his own covenant was going to be set aside and replaced by one uh, not made by hands, as St. Paul will later say. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, just so, that's just so beautiful. You know, I, I think about the, the priesthood today as this goes all the way back to Melchizedek. And we, we mentioned this at the beginning of our discussion, that when you go to an ordination and you hear that these priests are, are ordained priests in, in the order of Melchizedek, is there more than just being connected all the way back there? Is the Levitical priesthood substantially different than the Melchizedek priesthood and the modern priesthood? Yeah, the Levitical priesthood was. Again, it was a plan B, mm -hmm. and it was also uh, confined to the tabernacle and the ark and that form of worship. Uh, so the role of the Levites is finished when the tabernacle is replaced by the body of Christ. John 2.21, he mm -hmm. spoke of the temple of his body. Um, so, you know, first of all, the, the new temple is Jesus himself, and then by extension, since he gives us his body to eat, we, the church, become his mystical body, and we also are the temple. So the Levites are not given a role in the temple body of the Messiah. They're given a role in the tabernacle of Moses, and then later its successor, the temple that Solomon is authorized to build in Jerusalem. So with the cessation of those places of worship, their role is complete. But there's this beautiful line in Acts 6-7 that says, a great many of the priests were also obedient to the faith. Mm -hmm. And I really see that that event where you have a mass conversion of the priesthood at the very early point in the church's growth, that's a fulfillment of that promise back in Jeremiah 33, which is not only to the sons of David, but also to the sons of Levi, that they would never lack a man to be a priest before God. We have this mass conversion of the Levitical priests in Acts 6, where these priests under the Old Covenant are baptized and they come to share uh, in the priesthood of Christ, because all the baptized share in the priesthood of Christ, and that's the royal or common priesthood, which we haven't talked about too much, but is very, very important uh, Catholic doctrine that we really need to embrace and learn to live out. Sure, you're speaking of, uh, Peter talks about the royal, Right, we're part of this First royal Peter priesthood. 2, 9. You and I are. I'm not. A, yeah. I'm not a clerical priest, but I am a, a right. priest in what way? How do I share yeah. in that? Yeah. Well, the the ministerial priests, men in holy orders, you can look at it like this: their job is to sanctify us, the laity, and mm -hmm. our job is to sanctify the world. Okay. So when we embrace the priesthood of Christ uh, as lay Catholics. Um, our role isn't necessarily to assist with the liturgy, although sometimes we can do that, and that's legitimate in certain roles, you know, a lector or an extraordinary minister of, the, of Holy Communion, etc. But that's not the primary call of the baptized royal or common priesthood. We are called, as the Second Vatican Council says, and, and, and really developed from Scripture, to sanctify the temporal order, which is a fancy way to, say, make the world holy. So this means making our homes holy. This means making uh, the job site holy. This means making, you know, our offices and our cubicle holy and making, uh, you know, uh, entertainment or finance or construction or whatever area of the world that we're engaged in, sanctifying that, making that, making that a holy place so that the, the, the holiness of God spreads over the whole earth 
and uh, you know we spread the gospel uh, in everyday life. I, I love that. So, so somebody today can look at the priesthood and say, well, I'm sharing in that priesthood in that I can't, I can't make bread and wine the body and blood, but I can, I can make Jesus known in the world right. today. I can allow that which I have consumed, which is the bridegroom, Jesus, I can make him known. And make him present. And make him present. Absolutely. In, yeah. In the world. In places where, you know, Father Joe can't get to. Yeah. Because Father Joe has to celebrate the sacraments for us. Yeah. Isn't it a shame, Dr. Yeah. Bergsma, how many people resist this? Yeah. How many people resist the idea of a priesthood? Yeah. And, and I think it gets back to, one, not knowing the Old Testament really well and the necessity of a priest. Number two, not understanding the early church and that Jesus' body and blood, soul, and divinity was real, which necessitates a priesthood. A priesthood. Yeah. And oh, if people could get a hold of that, they would have that fullness. You and I made that, that uh, leap across the swim across the Tiber, but right. how many people out there right now are hungering and their, their lives are are a mess and they really need. That's right. They need yeah. Jesus in this way. They do, they do. You know, and, and I think, you know, we always pride ourselves as Calvinists of like, well, we believe the priesthood of all believers. And I still believe that. I still believe in the priesthood of all believers, as I said, to go out and sanctify the temporal order. But I'll tell you, Jeff, that my my role as a as a uh, baptized priest, as it were, sharing in, in that form of Christ priesthood, has taken off on turbochargers since I came into the Catholic Church and started being fed the Eucharist by the ministerial priests, sure. the men in holy orders. And, uh, and we work together, you know, we work together as the body of Christ. And, and a beautiful illustration of that cooperation between, say, the baptized priesthood and those in holy orders is, is the bringing up of gifts at the Mass, where the, the laity bring up the unconsecrated bread and mm -hmm. wine. And in the in liturgical theology, that really that unconsecrated bread and wine that re represents like the raw material of our weekly labor, you know, all the changing of diapers, paying of bills, you know, taking kids to soccer practice, all that. That's all brought up, and then the uh, the man in holy orders takes that and calls down the Holy Spirit on it, and it becomes the Eucharist, and together we offer mm -hmm. uh, the Eucharist. And so, just as it takes the baptized uh, priesthood to actually farm the land and produce uh, bread and wine. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so also we need the, the, uh, uh, the men in holy orders, the ministerial priesthood, to call down the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and together it becomes the Eucharist. And it really is almost in the Mass, a double epiclesis, you know, of a yeah. priest calling down the Holy Spirit, and then the prayers of, uh, of institution, this is my body, this is my blood, this is where everything changes. But there's almost this calling down upon the Holy Spirit on our lives as well. Yes. And that, that perhaps is tied to this idea of the priesthood of the, of the believers. Right, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Wow. Well, we've covered it so much and it is so great. You wrote a book on this. I did, yeah, Jesus and the Old Testament Roots of the Priesthood. It's available mm -hmm. from Emmaus Road. In yeah. Steubenville, yeah. Well, I would I would really recommend that that people get that and and go deep into it because, yeah, sure, maybe you don't remember everything that is being taught here, and you're thinking, well, now I know all that. I'll go out and share that with my friends, but you can come up with uh, the basic structure of this argument from the Old Testament priesthood to the New Testament priesthood. And Dr. Bergsma, would you, would you, for those that are sitting right now and watching us talk about this, and they're not in the church, but they're intrigued. It's like, wow, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what would you say to them? Yeah, I would say, look, I've written a book just for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Stunned by Scripture, How the Bible Made Me Catholic. And if folks so what's want the title to get again? Stunned by Scripture, Stunned. How the Bible Made Me Catholic, uh -huh. yeah, Our Sunday Visitor Press. And I've got a whole chapter in there about the priesthood and how I worked through this from a Protestant mentality, just kind of a sola scriptura mentality, just standing with Scripture and kind of putting two and two together and really uh -huh. coming to the conclusion that there really has to be a, a, new, uh, a new priesthood for the new covenant. So I, you know, literally encourage people to, you know, check that out, you know, if you, if you, and, and if you think I'm wrong, go, go read it. If you think I'm wrong, reach out to me. <laughs> sure. oh, I beautiful. want to hear from you. It's yeah. beautiful. Well, this has been one of the best uh, presentations of the priesthood that I have ever 
been a part of, and you just laid it out so beautifully and tied yes. it all all together, made something very complex, simple to understand. And, uh, and once you can understand this, I think you can enjoy it a, yeah. lot, a lot more. You become confident. Yes. You become con confident in, uh, in, our, in our faith. Hi, I'm Jeff Cavins, and I'm excited to introduce you to the Ascension app. It contains the full text of the Great Adventure Bible, the full text of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and both the Bible and Catechism in a Year podcasts. The app has special features that make the connections between the Bible and the Catechism crystal clear, like color-coded cross-links and easy navigation. It also answers nearly 1,000 questions from Bible in a Year listeners about the Bible with videos from myself and others, also audio clips and excerpts from Ascension's popular books. To download the app, simply go to the App Store on your phone and search Ascension. I hope you enjoy it. I enjoy it, carry it around everywhere I go. Uh, Dr. Bergsma, you, you really have dedicated your whole life to teaching scripture and you do it, you do it so well, but how do you relate to your Bible? Do you have a pattern every day? Uh, yeah. Do you have many Bibles? Do you mark them? Tell me about that. Yeah, yeah, I have many Bibles. I have one main Bible. Uh, it's a RSV Second Catholic Edition Burgundy from Ignatius. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been rebound twice, and now it's falling apart for what might be the last time because I don't think I can rebind it anymore. But I, I keep using it because it has all my notes, all my scribbles, all my underlining in it. And uh, so I use it for class lecturing. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's at home on my kind of like my, my spiritual reading shelf. Um, I always uh, uh, carry a New Testament with me as well. In Ohio, we call this concealed carry, <laughs> and then you can draw on somebody when you're in spiritual combat. Exactly. And uh, but I learned the habit of carrying a New Testament with me from uh, the Catholic who eventually became my sponsor into the church, uh, who who carried this very edition. This is a confraternity edition uh, published by uh, Scepter uh, Publishers. Uh, that's divided into uh, daily readings for the whole year. Okay. And so I do the daily reading, and sometimes I'll do more. Like right now, it's the, um, you know, during the Easter season, uh, I like to read the book of Acts and then, you know, look for the action of the Holy sure. Spirit, circle that, meditate on that. So I keep this uh, with me, and that always goes right there in that pocket. And then I also like to, um, I, leave, uh, I leave some Bibles out. In the open, I leave one open to the Psalms, and I like to read five Psalms a day uh, at every three hours. You start with the Psalm of the day of the month. So uh, if it's the 16th, uh, you know, you read Psalm 16. Three hours later, you read Psalm 46. Three hours later, you read Psalm 76, and you go by 30, so you know, keep adding 30. Mm -hmm. uh, and that way, you read five a day. That's, uh, uh, you know, Who taught you that? My mother taught me that. Really? I don't know where she got it from, but I think it's kind of a poor man's litur liturgy of the hours <laughs> is really what it what, was. And you've been it, doing it all these years. Yeah, yeah, sporadically, yeah. but I've come back to it um, mm -hmm. in, uh, in my older uh, years, did it you know, faithfully when I was in my adolescence and in college. And also a, um, a chapter from Proverbs uh, of the day as well. And Proverbs has 31 chapters, so it usually goes by mm -hmm. the month. So I like to keep those Bibles open, and then I'll have a... A, a Hebrew Bible, open maybe a Greek Bible, and periodically check the original language just to you know keep those languages fresh. Uh, and I add the Aramaic and the Ugaritic. Yeah, of and course so that you gives do. me four, but I don't want to talk about that right now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, knew, I knew you did. Yeah, right. <laughs> In my dreams. Okay, so marking your Bible. You talk yeah. about you've been marking it, and you are known for your stick figures. Yes. Do you put stick figures in the Bible? I do not put stick figures in my Bible. My margins aren't big enough for it. Okay. Um, but uh, I definitely do them on the chalkboard when I teach. Mm -hmm. Or if I go to parishes, we put them up on the screen, and they animate in real time like a PowerPoint or something. What do you, what do you but, think about that? You know, when it's all said and done, people look back and say, Dr. John Bergs, what a great man of God. And someone says, yeah. I remember those stick figures. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad that they remember the stick figures. That's the whole point. Um, you know, some of my colleagues uh, just <laughs> look at me with disdain and contempt <laughs> that I lower myself to do this. But I am willing to be, you know, St. Paul says, de be debased in front of men <laughs> if, it will, if it will help people remember the scriptures. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, and, and, and the kids remember it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay, so you got your Bible that you mark in. You, certainly, you came up with a system for marking 25 years ago with different colors and pens, and you have 
stuck with it every day all these years. Is that right? No. <laughs> Random underlining, you know, it's, it's whatever color pen I had. I'm like, oh, this is cool. Oh, what do I got yeah, here? Right. There's a pencil. <laughs> you know, screw all that. So it's it's just a mess. Uh-huh. You know? uh, I've never been able to you know keep a system to it, but it's all marked up and it's kind of like a mental map. And it just probably looks like gibberish to somebody else. But when I look at the page, I'm like, oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. This is how this fits together. Yeah, you've been with it so long. Thanks. Uh, well, thanks for yeah. you know, letting us get into your, your world. It sounds like a lot of our worlds. You know, you've got your pens, yeah. markers, whatever. But it's important to have some routine, isn't it? it? Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. This is why I like to keep the New Testament with me. And that way, um, you know, if my day's schedule is crazy and I'm running around taking kids to, you know, track practice or running to catch a plane, uh, I've got no excuse why I can't do my mm-hmm. scripture reading for the day because it's 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 right there, and uh, and I like to have a paper copy. I do yeah. use Bible on my phone too. Do make use of that because it's it's too much to carry an entire Bible with me at all times. And I do like to read a mm-hmm. Psalm, you know, uh, you know when I might be out uh, at lunch at a restaurant or something like this. Um, but I like having that paper copy because uh, nobody texts you to your uh, you know to your print Bible when you're trying to meditate. Not, not yet. Yeah. <laughs> so. so it's great to, uh, to see how you live in your Bible as you delve into the Bible. Are, are there any characters or one character that you really identify with? Yes, the Apostle John, my namesake Apostle, or I'm his namesake, however you want to st- state that. But yeah, always been my favorite character. I got my first uh, Bible when I was about five years old, living in New Jersey. Aunt sent money to the family. Parents took us out. We each got a fam- a, a Bible, always King James Version. You know, we figured if the King James was good enough for St. Paul, it was good enough for us. <laughs> so um, it's King James Red Letter Version. And uh, as soon as I got it, I paged through looking for all red pages. You know, just fascinating. Wow, like all these pages, it's entirely the words of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Quickly found that the most all red pages are in the Gospel of John. So Gospel of John immediately became my favorite part of the Bible, still is my favorite part of the Bible. The Apostle John, still my my favorite character. I feel a deep, uh, you know, kinship with him. Uh Uh, He was the youngest. He was the oldest. I was the youngest in my family. Um, never considered to be, to you know, is going to amount to much or anything. You know, just kind of forgotten the little guy, you know. And and, uh, and John often seems to be that, you know, that tag along to Peter, you know, in the in the Gospels. So I felt this kind of kinship. Um, but uh, but yeah, and what what beautiful, you know, what depths in the Gospel of John and Revelation, the Epistles as well. So, so how about a favorite verse? I would imagine. I don't know, maybe your favorite verse comes from John, but you know, I always try to, to talk to people about yeah. having a life verse or certain yeah. verses that have become real pillars in your life. And I, I, right. I have one, Galatians 2.20, but yeah. is there a verse that is like, okay, that's, that's on the grave? Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know if on the grave, but um, but <laughs> but definitely kind of a, a guiding light passage is Philippians four four through nine. Mm-hmm. You know, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Do not be anxious. Uh, in everything by prayer and petition, uh, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Um, that whole passage um, is uh, kind of a, a huge corrective because myself and my whole family is kind of given to melancholy, to you know pessimism, cynicism. And um, so my first several uh, sermons when I was a pastor were out of Philippians, um, especially out of Philippians 4. And uh, it was kind of like self-therapy. I liked to preach from Philippians, this epistle of joy, mm-hmm. and, uh, and keep coming back to that passage to, to uh, you know, kind of uh, correct my own you know, uh, uh, unredeemed tendencies, as it were, and keep focused on giving thanks to the Lord and trusting Him and mm-hmm. uh, place my hope in Him through prayer. There are a number of questions that people have, uh, have given us that relate to this period that we want to ask you. And are you ready? Yeah, okay. absolutely. So Alan asks, I am hoping you can explain the role of the high priest. I'm not clear on what makes him special or sets him apart from the other priests. Well, the most important liturgical celebrations were reserved for the senior son of Aaron, who was alive at that time. So in particular, the Day of Atonement, which was the highest 
uh, most solemn liturgical observance for the Jewish liturgy. Mm -hmm. That's when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies. That's the only time when anybody would go into the Holy of Holies. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. That's where God's presence was localized. It was dangerous. They would actually tie a a rope to his uh, leg in case he died back there so they could drag him out without anybody else risking their life to go back Mm -hmm. there and fetch the body. Uh, So a very solemn occasion. So yeah, the the high priest was a father figure for the entire people, uh, a father among fathers, much like the Pope is for us. And uh, and he represented the people in worship. And uh, he also wore a robe that matched the veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place or the holy of holies. Mm -hmm. And so he was kind of like the temple man. He was the man whose body represented the the whole temple and was connected to the temple in a mystical sense, Mm -hmm. a kind of a new Adam figure. Um, So yes, the the high priest had a very important role. He was kind of the the sacred embodiment of the whole people of Israel Mm -hmm. that represented the people before God. In the New Testament, it, it, it kind of becomes confusing, you know, when you talk about the high priest and a priestly family, and there's different names brought up at different times. And you mentioned earlier that things have become a bit polluted when it yes. comes to this, this. There's a number of people. Of course, Jesus is the great high priest. But when you're reading the New Testament, it sure can be confusing. It is, yeah. You've got Can- uh, Annas and Caiaphas, and that's because... Pontius Pilate uh, and the other Roman governors were appointing the high priests on an annual basis. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> this would be like the prime minister of Italy appointing the pope every year. Yeah, you know? right. <laughs> and it was just a, you know, a profanation of, of uh, the high priesthood. But you have this contrast in the passion narrative between Christ the true high priest and these imposters. And one of the ways that comes out in the Gospels is the way that our Lord is wearing this seamless tunic in uh-huh. John 19. And the only seamless tunic that we know of from that time period is was the one that Josephus records, which was the seamless garment of the high priest. Mm. And in God's providence, it's not torn. That's the famous episode where the soldiers throw lots for it. It remains untorn. And uh, Leviticus prohibited the garment of the high priest from being torn. But, of course, contrast that with what happens at the trial in the other three Gospels, where Caiaphas, of course, rips his garment mm-hmm. when he... You know, here's blasphemy, which really wasn't blasphemy from our Lord. And so you have that contrast between uh, these two priestly garments, our Lord's and Caiaphas's, yeah. one intentionally torn, one providentially kept untorn. And, uh, you know, it points to who's le- the legitimate high priest. And the ripping of the veil. Indeed, connected there as well. Yeah. yeah. All right, Samantha. Samantha's question, in the Old Testament, it seems like people didn't really choose what they wanted to do in life, but simply followed what their fathers did. Today, there is a lot of emphasis on following your dreams, doing what we want. Do you think this is good, or is it making people selfish? It's a really good question. Um, And I think, uh, to a certain extent, it's right. Um, The uh, priesthood in the Old Testament was a uh, familial thing. So uh, sons inherited it from their fathers. Mm-hmm. And that was true of most um, you know, vocations or most jobs, occupations back then. You basically did what your father did. So there's less choice there. However, um, in the Old Testament, uh, priests and really everyone was called to faithfulness. And uh, the priests that inherited that role from their fathers were nonetheless called to be faithful to that role. And that's a commonality between the covenants. Um, It's true that we get more of a kind of a conscious choice of what what we do, but like the priests of the Old Covenant, we too are called to be faithful to God's call. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more complicated for us. We have to spend some time, as she mentions, in discernment, trying to figure out what what is God's call specifically for me. But when we discover it, uh, we need to be faithful to it. And so the prophets, the kings, the priests of the Old Testament were called to be faithful to what God had designated them for to lean into, as we say nowadays, to lean into their role, their calling. And, uh, and we need to as well. And um, to, uh, Samantha makes a good point. You know, is this leading to selfishness? I think it can. Uh, when I was discerning my own vocation, I didn't find it helpful for people to ask me, what do I want? Because I thought, well, what I'd like to do is stay in bed all day, eat chips, watch television, you know? Uh, <laughs> I don't think that's 
very productive. I, I thought it was better to frame it, at least for me, it was better to frame it in terms of what does the world need and what does the church need? And what can I do to, to meet that need? Instead of what, what do you want? Yeah, instead of simply what I want. And, uh, and I looked out there and I saw needs and I said, yeah, there's a match between some of those needs and, and the gifts that God has given me. And yeah. so I, I tried to, to do that. And I found that more helpful. I respond better to felt needs and trying to, trying to observe, you know, what's got to be done and, and what am I able to do to contribute to that. All right, Luke says, uh, asked the question, is there, this is good, is there a difference between the Levitical priesthood and rabbis? Oh, yeah, that's a great that question. That is a good one. There's a huge difference. So the Levitical priesthood is established by Moses. Um, it is testified to in Scripture. Uh, so we read about it, you know, God's word. So established by prophetic authority, God speaking through Moses. Rabbis are not found in the Old Testament. I mean, let that sink in. You never find a rabbi mentioned. Um, synagogues are not mentioned in the Old say, Testament. I was going to say, you don't hear those either. You don't hear those either. The, the, rabbis and synagogues were a post-biblical development um, after more or less the close of the Old Testament canon. So in, in what we call the uh, Jewish diaspora, when the Jewish people became scattered all over the Mediterranean rim, uh, you had many uh, little colonies of Jews in most Roman cities that were very far removed from the temple in Israel. And how were they to maintain their culture and their faith? What they did was they gathered together in a home, which eventually they would set aside specifically for that purpose, and that was called a synagogue, which means a coming together or a meeting place. And then uh, a, a, a kind of a, an order or, or a movement of teachers arose, and this is called, these were the rabbis. Rabbi means great one, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like a Latin magister, which means teacher, big one. Um, and uh, they would become skilled in the law and they would teach people law. But again, this is a post biblical development. Uh, we, we find a strange thing happening in, in the Gospels in the, in the first century. And we talked about this uh, in, in the, the longer episode. But, uh, but because of the political corruption of the uh, priesthood, um, the rabbis in uh, the, the middle of the 100s BC kind of moved into that religious teaching vacuum when the people began to lose confidence in the priesthood and began to teach the people and control the people's understandings of the law and how it should be applied. And that's the situation we find ourselves in uh, when our Lord is ministering. Uh, not everybody agreed. The Essenes complained bitterly about this. Of course, the Essenes are the ones that left us the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were a competing movement that was about maybe a little smaller than the Pharisees, but still you know, pretty significant. Mm -hmm. They rejected the, uh, the teaching of the rabbis. The rabbis were mostly Pharisees. And among the Essenes, they did have men who descended from the true priestly line. And they insisted that those men were the ones who were to give the interpretation of the law. Of course, our Lord does a new thing. He says, no, these 12 men that I've chosen, they're going to be the ones that are going to interpret the law for God's people from here on out. Okay, Oliver, was Moses part of the Levitical priesthood? He was not. Is this not interesting? He, yeah. was, a, he was a prophet. And he set up the liturgy, but he was not primarily a liturgical functionary. It wasn't his role to just continually offer sacrifice and to do the things that a priest did. Okay, you know, occasionally by his prophetic authority, he did perform sacrifices mm -hmm. and he gets it going. And we see this out throughout Scripture, kind of an interesting phenomenon. Prophets can set up a liturgy, but thereafter it's run by priests. Right. Um, so Moses uh, was or not... kings part... by the name of Saul. Yeah, <laughs> when they muscle in. Uh, so yeah, so there's a, a kind of a, a, a distinction there, but his older brother uh, Aaron was the one who headed up uh, the priestly order of the Levites. Mm -hmm. Simone, can you help me understand why Catholic priests can't get married? Priests in the Old Testament got to be married, so why can't the priests of the New Testament be married? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. It and it, it's true that priests in the Old Testament could get married, but they had to remain continent when they were serving in the temple. And so they would serve for periods of time uh, during which they had to abstain from relations with their wife. And uh, thereafter, you know, they were off duty for a period of time and then they would come back. Well, in the new covenant, uh, our priests are on duty all the time. So. Mm -hmm. What logically follows from that is kind of a perpetual continence, and that's kind of priestly celibacy. And that's, that was a rec recognized in kind of an early stage in church history, and there's been studies on that 
um, great, book, great book by a certain uh, Jesuit father, uh, Cochini, uh, called The uh, Apostolic Origins of Priestly Celibacy that you can get from Ignatius Press. Kind of goes into that in depth, but um, that's kind of the commonality there. Yes, this has been a real, a real delight. I mean that in yeah. in in talking to you about this. You're you're a rich, rich source of not only about the priesthood, but so many things Catholic. And you, you know, I talk to people around the country who have been to Steubenville, and they 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 talk about how much they enjoyed your your classes and your stick men. Thank you. And people will have stick to Stick women, too. Are there stick women? There's stick, stick women. Stick children? Uh, yes. Stick dogs? No. Oh, okay. Yeah, no dogs. It's not like I crossed careful. a line. Yeah, there. yeah, no, no. Animals get careful treatment. It's <laughs> just the people that are sticks. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, people, you know, if you're looking for a school to go to, to, uh, to college, Steubenville is just absolutely incredible. And it really is a different environment, isn't it? It is, yeah. What, what would be your, your number one selling point of why people might want to consider Steubenville? Uh, you're going to come away with a prayer life. Okay. Um, and, uh, and you're going to come away with a vision for what Catholic life can really be. Mm. And that vision can help sustain you for the rest of your life thereafter. That's true. And, uh, and you can go and you'll know what to, you'll have a vision for what to recreate when you go out to wherever it is that yeah. God sends you. So please come to us. Uh, we're as serious as ever. The spirit is alive and well, and uh, we're just leaning further into it, not further away. How do people get in touch with you? Yeah. So uh, catholicbibleteacher.com. Uh, we'll That's redirect. where it went. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 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 yeah, because uh, people can't remember how to spell Bergsma. But uh, yeah, catholicbibleteacher.com gets me to my website. Uh, I got a bunch of audio and, and uh, you know books and stuff like that that they can check out pilgrimages things like that. Sure. And there's a you know if they want to get a message to me there's a little um, little window there that they can get a message in through and I try to respond to those. So uh, that's where you can do it. I appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate absolutely, you Jeff. Being on the show, yeah. very very much. Thank you. Thank you for watching. If you would like to see more amazing content on the Bible, be sure to like and subscribe.